Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. We are here at a special time um, so that we can accommodate everybody, um, including Chris Sloan and Bianca. You're going to have to say your last name for me in Ireland, where it is 6 p.m. right now. Um, Gary Steger and um, <laughs> Sylvia Martinez are um, in Los Angeles, and um, Chris, I'm sorry, Paul O is out there in California too. And Michelle um, Hagerman is with us, um, and I am here. Uh, you're, you'll tell us where you are in a second. Uh, but, but welcome, everybody. We're here to talk about, on Teachers Teaching Teachers, we're here on the 16th of July to talk about Invent to Learn. Our second conversation, um, we had a conversation on Friday about this as well. Um, and part of why we're going to talk about this is, uh, well, Chris Sloan will explain. But this is part of the makesummer.org, the educatorinnovator.org um, partnerships that um, Paul O can describe in a little more detail um, as we go here. Uh, Chris, can I throw it to you and have you um, introduce some of the folks here and what we're hoping as she leaves? But that's okay. We'll get Bianca back. Sure. Yeah. But, Sure. Thank so, you, uh, and, and Gary for joining us. By the way, Go ahead. yeah, my pleasure. So, um, we uh, are in an overseas program. So, American, uh, mostly, well, English-speaking teachers are studying in Europe because a lot of them are around the world, uh, and so we're studying as part of a program for the masters in educational technology through Michigan State University. And one of the texts that we use is Invent to Learn. So then um, I, so Michelle will introduce her connections here shortly. But then Bianca, who uh, will join us here shortly, is a maker from Dublin who is also, a, you know, a really uh, an amazing educator too. And so when we were talking, she said, oh, yeah, I read that book too. And so um, we'll... Uh, hear from her. She's having a little bit of issues, I think, right now with her uh, uh, thing, <laughs> the Hangouts there. So anyway, uh, that was kind of the context of a uh, little bit of what uh, made me think about uh, all these people here at this one time. Cool. So it's, it's great to have the authors here, um, Gary and Sylvia. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves a little bit? Uh, um, let's start that way. Gary, why don't you introduce yourself and then tell us how how, how and why um, this book came about. Just start there, if you don't mind. Well, I am was, was once an aspiring musician, became a teacher. I've taught everything from preschool through the doctoral level. And for the past more than 30 years, have been advocating for kids to learn how to program and then later build robotics and do similar engineering um, activities in schools as a way of, of constructing knowledge and um, ha have been involved in the launch of one-to-one -one computing in schools and some of the early stuff on online education and have, have worked and spoken and consulted with schools all over the world trying to help teachers make sense of, of modernity and make, make school the best seven hours of a kid's life. So the, the, the maker movement was was sort of catching up with a lot of what I pr provided a modern context for what I'd been doing all along. And our book was an attempt to build a bridge between three distinct communities. One, an educational technology community that I don't think gives enough thought to learning. Um, the progressive education community that hadn't given a lot of thought to modernity. And the maker community that had terrific uh, intuitions and insights and expertise. but um, hadn't really thought of what they were doing in, in a, a rich educational context, both h historical and theoretical. Yeah, and I mean, that's what attracted, uh, certainly Chris and I had talked a lot about that, and we did uh, on Friday. Um, like, bringing those three together is pretty exciting. Sylvia, introduce yourself, maybe, and how you got involved in, with this. <laughs> Sure. Um, my my undergraduate degree is actually in electrical engineering, and I've worked in aerospace. I've worked in um, game programming and game development before coming to education. A lot later than Gary, obviously. Um, but you know that background 
was really calling to me and you know working with schools on on using technology when the maker movement came along it just seemed like this perfect marriage where you could bring the digital and the real world together um, you know and I worked with so many people over the years in industry who felt like school had failed them who were brilliant scientists brilliant engineers brilliant makers and they just didn't feel like school was meant for them um, and so we wanted to try and help teachers understand some of those kids um, kids who thrive on making but maybe not on testing and um, help kids who thrive on testing understand that there's more out there than than testing so you know writing this book has been a, a tremendous um, you know the way it's been accepted by people all over the world it's just been fantastic um, we feel just you know really humbled by people saying that it's working for them. It's saying things that they they wanted to hear. It's helped them. Um, it, it's been just fantastic. You know, you write a book for education. You think now, oh, like twelve people are going to read it. You know, including your mom. And it's <laughs> the response has just been fabulous. Um, we had 180 people last week at our construct constructing modern knowledge summer institute, making and doing exactly what we were talking about in the book. And it just to see it come to life is so fantastic so fabulous do you, do you want to say can you say more about what that looked like the constructing modern knowledge oh gosh um, well I, I don't know Gary if you could paste the link of, of your it. post up up in the uh, website we've collected some of the blog uh, posts some of the photos videos um, videos we had people making like gigantic Rube Goldberg machines that combined you know, programming and makey makeys and little bits and electronics and Arduinos and people were like attaching things to the ceiling and and then there was a room full of people programming and computer, you know, making games and there were people um, building soft sculptures and using the lily pad and, and programming lily pads and wearable technology. Sound and, slippers. Yeah, a, group, a team made um, shoes that when you walked it played music and you know this was all without without one tutorial without one lesson um, just by creating this context for learning like you know we talk about it a little bit in the book um, we really feel like the the model can be expanded that um, people can do extraordinary things when you give them the, the space and the time and the materials and the support mm -hmm. kids too I mean not just adults I mean this is this is more about kids than it is about adults. There, there, there was a group of teachers, and we had folks from preschool through higher ed working together on teams. Um, there was a group of teachers who built a system that would um, monitor the moisture in soil and, man, and automatically water plants. And it not only included all the sensing and the programming behind that and building a robot that poured water through a tube into the plant, um, but they actually designed and 3D printed the parts they needed for for making the probe, um, and when asked mm -hmm. which parts of this had they ever done before, the answer was universally um, none of them. And and we have a protocol that basically just begins with what do you want to make, and then as Sylvia said, create the time and space um, and resource rich supportive environment where people are able to do extraordinary things. Um, without being taught and so the, 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 the sort of macro project of constructing modern knowledge is, is demonstrating that things need not be as they seem that the educational experience that you that you create for your own students can be a great deal less coercive um, you know, I, I think that that the maker movement is inseparable from from progressive education and if and if progressives don't embrace the tools and materials and energy um, and ethos of, the, of what's happening with making um, it may it may be game over for what a lot of us have dreamed about for my lifetime and probably the past hundred years. Great, that's a great introduction. Um, Paul O um, from the National Writing Project and Michelle, do you guys want to introduce yourselves so you can join the conversation as well? Welcome, Paul. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. It's great to be here, and uh, it's really um, a pleasure and an honor to be on this uh, program with Gary and Sylvia. Big fans of your work. I'm a big fan of your work. Thanks. Uh, so 
Yeah, so I think um, what Gary and Sylvia both are talking about is um, is at the heart in many respects of some of the work that um, we're involved with in the National Writing Project related to um, you know what's described as connected learning, um, which is a set of design principles um, that really undergird um, a particular set of initiatives that we have going on, uh, one of which is Educator Innovator, and actually Educator Innovator is the, the space. It's both a website and, um, as I've said, um, last week's episode, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but it's essentially a network of networks of organizations that I think have um, a similar ethos as to what Gary and Sylvia have described. You know, groups like, in fact, MakerEd, um, DIY.org, as well as a whole range of other organizations that um, really believe in some of the principles of connected learning, such as, you know, that I think Gary and Sylvia have uh, just named, like the notion that um, uh, learning should be production centered, uh, that there should be shared purpose, uh, that that uh, learning should happen um, with peers and uh, through openly networked spaces. Um, so so I would say that uh, it makes a lot of sense that you know we would want to uh, an educator or innovator sponsor this conversation. Um, and I would say as well, Educator Innovator is a persistent space and a persistent initiative. Um, so you all should definitely check it out when you have a moment. but, um, right now, we're part of a summer campaign, essentially, to bring visibility to all kinds of making projects uh, that are happening around the world, actually. So under this summer campaign, which you can see more about at makesummer.org, not only are there educator, innovator uh, projects, um, conversations like this one that are listed at, at the Make Summer calendar, but um, another partner is uh, the Mozilla Foundation, and they're supporting um, a whole set of maker party activities. You know, where basically um, young people and adults uh, can learn to, um, if not exactly code, but learn to build on the web using their web maker tools. Um, so it's a form of coding, you know, through HTML and and their web maker tools. Um, and then there's one last initiative that's part of the summer campaign, and that is Cities of Learning, where um, Again, you know, the kinds of experiences that Gary and Sylvia are describing are um, uh, up front in, and, and being made available uh, across cultural institutions. And that, that's the last thing that I want to say about connected learning, um, kind of exploding out this notion of um, what Gary was describing in terms of, like, what should be happening in schools. Um, uh, we believe, you know, th and I think what the connected learning principles describe is this notion of, of learning in schools as being just one node um, in an ecosystem of learning opportunities. So, for instance, uh, you know, the kinds of making opportunities that, you know, might exist in school uh, definitely are happening in out-of-school spaces. And so what would it look like if, if we were able to create an educational um, environment in which we understood school to be just one element or one node in in a in sort of a variety of learning spaces and connect those uh, learning opportunities in some way for a young person. You know, I I think that the work that the National Writing Project um, to to try and help teachers understand how to work with these things. You know, making, very often people assume is about science or, or math, and, and not it's not about English, it's not about art, but it definitely is, and I think there's so much to learn from organizations like the National Writing Project who have continued over the years to give teachers the resources to understand authentic assessment, to bring real experiences and authentic experiences in the classroom. You know, you look at what the, the um, arts educators organizations, what they know is exactly applicable to math and science classes and I think it's through this maker movement that values craftsmanship that values you know connecting all of the disciplines um, we can bring some of those th that knowledge that math that English teachers have that our teachers have um, to science and math I think all this sharing is extremely valuable cool and um, let me just kind of arbitrarily <laughs> invite Michelle to introduce herself so that you can jump in in the conversation too. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Michelle Heckerman from Michigan State University. I um, am actually joining you in from um, Huntsville, Ontario, Canada today. Um, so I've been here with my family for the last week and a half. It's been lovely. Um, but this is a terrific chance to speak with you, Sylvia, and you, Gary. Um, at Michigan State University, I direct the uh, graduate certificate programs in uh, educational technology and online teaching and learning. 
and we are um, you know work very closely with the Masters of Educational Technology program um, that Chris is also a part of and our students uh, in one of the classes that we offer it's called CEP 811 are using your book as a foundational text and so I'm here because I'm really interested to hear um, your thoughts and your ideas about where we kind of go from here. As a teacher educator, um, we've been working really hard over the last year as part of this class to introduce um, some of the ideas that you treat in your book and to really um, help teachers make connections from the work that they do in their classrooms to this notion of making and inventing and interdisciplinary um, engagement with projects that you know for many teachers feel maybe kind of outside of their comfort zones and we've been really working hard to build um, connections so that teachers see a place for themselves and for their curriculum sort of within the sphere of the maker movement more broadly um, so yeah so I really come at this from a perspective of teacher education trying to get teachers on board with this and I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, you know what you see working um, for teachers, as you have, as you have also identified, I mean, there are those for whom it seems a really great and automatic and simple fit, um, and then there are others for whom the connections seem a little bit more abstract. And I would really love to hear your thoughts about how we support teachers making those connections. We actually have one more introduction to make too, so I will let her do that. I think I'm delayed. That's okay. No, we we can hear you though. Yeah. yeah. I'm back. I'm Hello. Back. I froze. I'm I'm s i am i am I was still hearing the finishing of or uh, Michelle finishing up there. Um so you would my turn name the broadcast off, yeah. Go ahead. Is this working? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Colosi. I'm a teacher in Traverse City, Michigan. I teach at a charter school there, and I teach high school science and junior high science classes um, and graduated from the MAET program last year. And essentially, I basically um, created a maker class at my school for a six-week elective that ran on Fridays. So it was six Fridays, three hours a Friday, and it was a great way for me to just test the waters in um, creating this sort of a class in a school environment. And a lot of my inspiration came from the MAET program, and that's really what drove me to do this. And invent to learn really um, helped guide the process for me. Um, and uh, approach my administration with the idea and then just figure out a way to fill three hours for fri uh, six Fridays with um, some maker ideas for a junior high, a combined junior high and high school course. So you made a lot of connections. So let me try to say a theme that I'd love for a uh, uh, talk around and that is like we're, we're in, the, in the summertime and um, Sylvia and Gary, you started with a very exciting description of the constructing modern knowledge, and I'm, you know, behind me here. I'm working with students and teachers in a Youth oh, Voices wow. uh, summer program that goes for three weeks. And I was writing this morning about how why doesn't my classroom look like what this is in the summertime? Um, and so, uh, like a, a, and that's something that we often think about. <laughs> You know, writing projects do amazing things in the summertime. When we go back to school and, you know, the institutions of school kind of hit us. Um, and I hear, Paul, what you said about nodes and stuff, but can we make maker stuff become more central? Um, and what you just described, I, it's, uh, Chris, your friend there, I'm sorry. You know, it was Fridays for six weeks. Mm -hmm. so, so my general question is, can we bring the maker movement more central into the curriculum, or should we just relax and let it be an after-school program? <laughs> I think you can, but I think that's a skill, and I think it's going to take training for teachers. Um, just running a strictly maker class for those six weeks um, was challenging, um, but it certainly hasn't prohibited me from wanting to do more with it or work it into my um, my content area. What made um, it challenging? What? Well, management, um, because you know, I the beauty of it is that I really didn't come in with a plan. I came in with um, each Friday came with a new 
maker idea. A lot of these I got from the book and allowed students to kind of play with that for a little bit and then they were free to do what they wanted you know within reason um, either with a previous project or with the new project um, but um, it's from a management perspective I was dealing with junior high and high school students I had 25 of them um, when I've got eight students learning to solder for the first time and another eight students that are putting uh, snap circuits together and trying to launch uh, projectiles as high as they can in class. At the same time, I've got makey makeys going. It turned into a management nightmare, really. Um, but you know, I'm I'm busy enough and I can handle that, and so I had no problem trying to deal with that. But it's a learning process, um, and uh, and uh, I would say the other aspect was the shopping, all the shopping I had to do to get the materials to do all these things, um, and so. It's a learning process, I think, as a teacher in how to manage that. Um, and you know, we were trying everything, all at you know, all at once, and so that made it challenging. But I'm sure there's better ways to manage it, and I can see better ways to manage it manage it now that I've kind of been through it a little bit. Say your name one more time. I'm sorry. I'm Chris. Also, you have two Chris's. Okay, good. <laughs> What's your last name? Golosi. Golosi. Okay. Okay. So. Sylvia, um, Gary, you want to jump in on some of these questions, <laughs> thoughts, or go ahead. Gary. Um, well, perhaps you should stop worrying about managing things. Um, and and I, I keep wondering, and I want to, I'm interested in talking to my, my colleagues who are also involved in teacher education. Um, I find that folks who taught in the 1970s know how to do all of this. It's just we've just added some colors to the crayon box, and and I'm wondering I'm wondering why there's such remarkable institutional amnesia about how to create productive contexts for learning. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a question than an answer, but yeah. it's it's something I spend a lot of time wondering about. If 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 I run into a teacher who taught 25 30 years ago, I can show them a makey makey or scratch or turtle art or any of the sorts of materials we're talking about and they say yup got it and the next day it's happening in their classroom and I, um, one of my hypotheses is that I think we've removed the art of teaching from from educational preparation and replaced it with nothing more than animal control and curriculum delivery um, but but folks who have who have experience working with materials with having kids engaged in in various activities at the same time. Um, to go back to the summer analogy, um, folks who worked at a summer camp and, and can keep kids happy when it rains for four days and you can't leave the deck where the ping pong table is. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think they find it so remarkable to, to use the new materials that have become available. Yeah. I think my management issues weren't, um, I think there's a misnomer that that relates to behavior problems and it wasn't behavior yeah. issues, it was that I had so many different students doing so many different things and there's one of me and yeah. so it, it did create an opportunity for other students to sure. help out. Um, That's a good but thing. From an instructional standpoint, um, a lot of kids needed assistance and I didn't have, you know, now I wish I had volunteers in the classroom or maybe I would bring in some people from the community to help with just helping kids get over those humps. They're not natural problem solvers and they do need a little guidance for that. Yeah, that's, that's all good. Yep. Yeah. I think, you know, what I hear from a lot of schools who are trying this is um, when they do it, they realize that the constraints of school are, are fighting against what they're trying to do the bell schedule, the 42-minute period, the division mm -hmm. between subjects, mm -hmm. and they start to question, like you said, does everything have to change? And changing everything is overwhelming, and yet that's kind of what has to happen. So you do what you can. You pick away at the edges. Maybe you collaborate with a colleague. A lot of the schools that are doing Maker are changing their schedule. That may have seemed impossible a year before, but now that they've seen what kids can do, it makes it seem more, more realistic that you know, it's not about entertaining kids for three hours or keeping them on task for three hours. We need those three hours. So, you know, it's a chicken and egg thing. I think sometimes the making comes first, sometimes the planning comes first, sometimes it just happens organically and kind of in a big explosion and it seems, you know, unmanageable, but then you do it anyway. 
Yes. I think for for me in in the context of my subject matter and my my content classes, um, I just need to spend more days on a project. I I can't change our fifty hour you know fifty minute periods, but I can let go of the fact that something sure. needs to be started and finished within fifty minutes. Um, and so can the kids. They have no problem coming back and continuing a project the next day. Right. And then, um, and so there's, yeah, and, and there's strategies for that. And, you know, I mean, what you were talking about managing materials to have enough materials for kids to be able to make whatever they want to make or need to make, and then leave it together long enough for other people to learn and be inspired by it. And you know, classroom tips like where to put the stuff and to have containers with lids so people don't poach parts. And all that stuff is legitimate. Um, but I, I'm I'm sort of fascinated by the by by the notion that this is some sort of learning revolution or um, or that people are surprised by what kids are capable of doing. You know, I, I expect kids to do extraordinary things. I'm surprised when the adults are surprised that they're capable of doing extraordinary things. One of the things I noticed about the, the book also was um, you know, the connection to the past. I, I was impressed with like the linkages to uh, all these thinkers that came before us because a, a lot of times when I hear people talking about making, like you just said, it sounds like you know it's a brand new thing. But um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, Seymour Papert must be, I mean, he seems to be a key figure in this book and in maybe your life. Mm -hmm. you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just him. Um, you know, Seymour Papert is remarkable. I'll give you a little biographical information in a second. In in that, in a number of ways. One that he was a gifted mathematician who had a great deal of empathy for others who weren't good at mathematics and wanted to do something about um, changing the conditions under which you can learn mathematics in what he called a math land as um, as freely and non-coercively and naturally as learning French by living in France as opposed to being taught French in a classroom in Milwaukee. Um, so he had that great empathy and I, I also believe that what made him um, distinctive among the theoreticians is that he he created a learning theory of constructionism the idea that the best way to ensure that knowledge is constructed is through the act of making something shareable. Um, but then he also had the courage to design some of the tools and materials that would make that come to life, whether it was programming languages for kids or robotic construction kits, etc., and described how that would look in practice and, in fact, demonstrated in school contexts all over the world, um, including a number of urban contexts. And, and the work that I did with him inside a prison for teenagers, um, that what this would look like in practice. And then, and then the third piece of his genius was predicting exactly the way in which the system would reject those innovations, no matter how productive they were, no matter how good they were for kids. Um, he's often dismissed as utopian for, for talking about what kids are capable of doing and for asking more of teachers. Um, but from from the first words he wrote in the mid 1960s about children and computers, um, he fully predicted how difficult it would be for, to get the system to embrace the sort of shift in agency from system and teacher to learner, um, and to use the computer as an intellectual laboratory and vehicle for self-expression that would that would amplify the potential of each kid. Um, now, on a practical level. <laughs> The personal computer was invented by Alan Kay based on visiting Seymour's research group and seeing what fourth graders were doing with computers in 1968. And Alan was so impressed by the mathematics these kids were engaged in that he sketched the Dyna book on the flight home, which is the predecessor of the laptop, um, to talking about 45 years ago every kid having a computer, to inventing the first programming language for kids and talking about kids as programmers at a time when most adults had no idea what that meant, to developing the first um, robotic system for kids to construct things and to be engaged in in modern engineering and on and on and on. Um, his contributions are remarkable, and not not the least of which being that when P Piaget wanted to understand how children learn mathematics, he hired Seymour. So, um, you know, the the Media Lab was an MIT Media Lab was another one of his inventions. 
one of the things that I think is a bit of a sideshow, but interesting is that there's a bit of an East Coast, West Coast rivalry, I think, shaping up in the maker community. That's not unlike Bebop and Cool Jazz or Biggie versus Tupac um, about, about sort of where the locus of innovation is, um, whether it's Silicon Valley or, or, or the Media Lab. I, I tend to think that most of the powerful ideas and the materials that, that are so rich that we're, we're using come out of, come out of the, the Media Lab. So Neil Gershenfeld was the first person to talk about Fab Labs. He credits Seymour. The you know Negroponte invented the Media Lab, where much of the technology we're using was was invented. Seymour was one of the inspirations and co-founders behind that. When one laptop per child comes out of Seymour's vision of of kids and computing. So um, there's just an enormity of in, of influence. And one of the things we referred to in our book um, is a paper that. Seymour and my, my colleague Cynthia Solomon, who's been on the faculty of Constructing Modern Knowledge for the last seven years, wrote in 1970 called 20 Things to Do with a Computer. And I, I'd, I'd like that to be a text in a teacher ed course. Um, I'd like teachers to read that paper and then go to their school where their student teaching and see how many of the, the things that they were talking about children doing with computers in 1970 are being done today and then deal with the issues of why or why that, that may not be the case. Hopefully that gives us yeah. sort Sorry, of... I'm, take, I'm taking notes. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I mean, my question for you, Michelle, is actually about the history chapter. I'm wondering the reaction what the reaction is in a teacher red context. Um, um, what the reaction to that is, because, is because one, one of my one great of my concerns, concerns is... is um, um, is understanding that we stand on the shoulders of giants and ha how little history of, of, of education innovation um, educators are being exposed to. And, mm -hmm. and you know, ed schools tend to like things like organizational leadership and educational leadership and management and reading books written by get-rich-quick authors um, without, without sort of paying any homage or respect to the, to the leaders in our own profession. Um, I keep picking up survey texts on using computers in the classroom, the sorts of books that we make students pay $130 for in a college yeah. course. And um, Papert doesn't make the index. It's not that they disagree with them, they just erase from history. Um, there's, there's no sort of sense of, there's no discussion of programming. In fact, uh, the ISTE standards don't mention programming. Um, mm -hmm. The, the forget maker movement, I mean, et cetera. So I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, so I fought hard for that chapter to be in a book. Um, <laughs> and and it's woefully incomplete and gives short shrift to a lot of stuff. But um, It wasn't fighting. We didn't <laughs> It was a good chapter. I like it. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I like it too, actually. And I, I should say that it is one of the chapters we assign um, <laughs> in our classes. Um, for that very reason, because I think it's important for teachers to have context. I think it's important for teachers to understand that this is an iteration of an idea, right, that has existed. And you're right, I mean, at MSU, uh, there's, a, there's a professor, um, his name is Jack Smith, in his sort of That's Foundations of Education. Pardon me? That's his secret spy name. His secret spy name, yeah, it's actually John P. Smith the Third. So, um, if he's watching, um, hi Jack. <laughs> but um, he talks about, yeah, just I mean, you know, the evolution of these ideas and sort of what ideas get traction, right, and what what ideas have gotten traction and those that have not, and um, you know, just talking about behaviorism, how behaviorism kind of won, and the ideas of Dewey kind of lost, um, you know, and it's, I, I think that, I mean, last week we were talking about, you know, this revolution. In the introduction to your book, you talk about a revolution that's kind of afoot. But it is, as Chris and Paul and, and Paul have talked about also, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a renewal, right? It's a return to these foundational ideas of creation and constructing ideas that are not new at all. And um, so we really feel that that is a very important part of the work that we're doing at MSU um, in our Masters of Ed Tech program. Um, 
you know, we don't have a textbook in the classes that I'm responsible for anyway. I mean, except to say we take selections from your work, we take selections from other people's work, and ask uh, students to make connections to their practice. And we, um, you know, assign, in, in fact, in our maker class, um, the textbook is a maker kit. I mean, students have to select a maker kit. Cool. And then using some of the ideas that they've um, explored through, you know, peer collaboration and discussion and, and with readings, they need to start making some connections and then operationalizing some of those ideas in the work that they produce for the class. So um, your point is really well taken, Gary, and I, I think it's absolutely essential for teachers today to have an understanding of um, the, you know, the evolution of these ideas because, you know, without that, right, then it's, it, it's in a vacuum, right? Well, we, I, I, I sometimes say that education continuously um, reinvents that which already exists each time with lowered expectations. Um, I mean, you know, a, 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 another, example, another example of that would be, you know, the folks from the writing project. I don't know how many of you have looked at a, at a literacy text in, school, in, in schools of ed recently, um, but again, it's not even, there's no whole language versus phonics debate any longer. One completely won and vanquished the other and, and sort of erased it from the history. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I shared an article in the, the sidebar, the chat that Papert wrote called What's the Big Idea, where he talks about idea aversion. And um, I, I think that's well worth worth considering as we go forward and, and try to create different kinds of experiences for teachers and kids. You know, one of the one of the things for me of, of writing the book was being able to kind of reread some of these amazing books and texts and papers and um, another Papert paper. I know we're dwelling on Papert, but he, he really you, you read what he wrote and you think, how can anyone not believe this? Um, and it's so it's, it's you know thirty years ago, and he's still right today. Um, but the use of computer as material was a was a big idea for me as as we put together the book, um, and we've seen it with a lot of, of teachers using materials and kids using materials. But using the computational technology just as a, um, a something that goes into another project, not that we're teaching kids to make things, it's that we're teaching them how to look at the world as a, a toolbox that they can solve any problem, they can tackle anything that they just have to look around or look up or look on the internet and and there are answers there, there are tools there. Um, you know, it's not about teaching kids to use a 3D printer, it's about having the experience with a 3D printer so that when they need to solve a problem, like how to make a sensor to, to uh, measure soil um, moisture, they think, oh, I can use the 3D printer, I can use this nails out of this toolbox, I can wire it to you know, a, a, another thing. I can make a Lego machine that, that pours water. All of those things are in their head because they've been in their hands. And this idea of computer as material, I think, is extremely powerful. And schools don't, at least recently, don't tend to think that way. They teach this, then they move on to that, and then Tuesday it's exponents, and Friday it's fractions, and you know, next Thursday it's, it's you know, phonemes. And, and we never let the kids get good at anything. We never let the kids master a tool like a craftsman masters their tools. Because when you know your tools and you know your material, they, they speak to you. Um, you know, sculptors talk about the materials telling them what parts to eliminate. Um, writers talk about the characters speaking to them and, and guiding the, uh, you know, the, the, the writing. Um, I think for a lot of mathematicians and scientists and programmers, the materials do things in similar ways, and school ignores all of that. Well, and and also just that, that one example of a kid can engage in that in that project without being front loaded with everything they need to know about soil and moisture and electronics and feedback and um, that that those challenges just sort of emerge. Um, you know what one of the one of the gifts I received from working in this prison for teens with these severely at risk kids, many of whom hadn't been in school since they were ten or twelve years old. Um, was that they would only tolerate a minute or two of instruction. And it turns out that in most cases you don't need more than a minute or two of instruction before you ask kids to do something. And, and, and that, that sort of gave us a discipline of, of showing what they need that second 
and then use sneaker net and walk around and sit next to a kid and collaborate and, and regroup if there's a teachable moment. Um, but without this sort of hierarchical idea of of what of everything they need to know and of and of backward designing the experience that eliminates any sort of chance for serendipity or or even complexity. You know, we we say I don't know if we say this explicitly in the book, but we've been saying it a lot since. The best thing that the school can do is to prepare kids to solve the problems that their teachers never in, never anticipated. That kids kids leave with the confidence and competence to think that they can solve a problem, even if only to discover there's a whole lot more that they need to learn. And and that's what's so exciting about constructing modern knowledge, which even though we work all year on it, um, I, I, I wish every educator could see and have the experience. It's hard to actually communicate what happens. But from a, a very simple prompt of what do you want to make to, okay, see in four days, it's not quite that simple, but Every year, folks do stuff that two years ago would have earned them a TED Talk and five years ago would have earned them a PhD, while the dominant thinking on, on teacher professional development is they need lessons in Twitter or to use an iPad or to how to turn pages in their textbook or you use a new gradebook program. We see teachers every year do absolutely extraordinary things, where, which changes their concept of themselves as learners. and, and during which they internalize the idea that the environment, the materials, the expectations for their own students could be dramatically different without us having any actual discussion sort of hitting them on the head about the pedagogical lessons of what they just experienced. Because if you're a constructionist, um, yeah, you sort of have to believe that folks will construct their own interpretation of the experience as opposed to having been taught about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, when I was, when <laughs> Sylvia came to visit me one night when I was teaching at Pepperdine University, and I was teaching a math science methods course for elementary school teachers. And, and, and I like to say that if we were really concerned about STEM education in America, we would find evidence of it first. Um, I asked what I thought was a, just a casual question. I said to the students, who were all student teaching, several dozen of them, so tell me about science in the school where you're student teaching. And as we went around the room, um, it was like Bigfoot. Everyone had heard about it. No one had actually ever seen it. Um, we got, uh, we're doing it after testing. The room is locked. The woman who does science is on maternity leave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in several semesters, there wasn't an actual student teacher who had seen any evidence of science taking place in their school at all. Now, this is in Southern California. It might be worse than other contexts, but I, but I suspect not. Um, and if we believe that knowledge is a consequence of experience, then, then folks need to have rich experiences. And that goes for kids and teachers as well. And the last thing I'll say about that is you can't behave as if the children are competent if you believe their teachers are incompetent. And, and this is a, a small sort of flaw and chink in the armor of a lot of the folks from outside of education who are um, advocating for making in the classroom. They say things like teachers are the creative bottleneck or schools are no longer viable. And I'm not willing to give up on schools because that's where the kids happen to be. Now, if we care about kids, then, then we need to work where they are. And like I said earlier, try to make the time they spend in school the best seven hours of their life. And I'm going to try my best. Um, Bianca couldn't be here, and she's this amazing Irish educator. And I think um, if she could, she would. I just put a link to her uh, classroom website. Um, she told a story of how she brought her fourth graders to a teacher uh, professional development conference and she turned the kids loose in the room and said okay show them something <laughs> and at first the kids were silent you know they were talking to their you know adults these teachers and then she said in no time these kids were actually teaching these teachers how to make making work in the classroom and by the time it was over, she said, you know, one kid was amazed that the 90 minutes had passed already. So, I mean, there's lots of examples. Well, we, say that, we say that all the time. In fact, one of the things, you know, structurally at Constructing Modern Knowledge, we don't cater. So there's no meals. Um, and one of the reasons why we have it in Manchester, New Hampshire, is there's 25 restaurants within walking distance. So we want people to get the idea that if you're hungry, go eat something. If you're, 
Um, make a friend. Have a you know that's the time to complain about your principal, not not while you're making things. And um, folks routinely work through lunch. This year we had a for, for the first time um, we said you can work the 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 night before it ended. Uh, continue working on your projects. And there were there were folks with incredibly bad wine working until we threw them out at midnight. Um, <laughs> that's a secret. <laughs> wine, wine they bought, wine they bought at the gas station across the street. Mm. Um, <laughs> and 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 so yeah, you see that all the time, you know. And this psychologists use the term "flow" to describe those sort of optimal learning experiences where you lose track of the clock. Um, the the challenge for educators is that we need to actually be honest about the t all the times we know that when we have kids for 42 minutes, if we had them for 44, they would understand what we were hoping they would understand, and instead we sent them somewhere else. And, um, I, you know, for all of these problems have been solved somewhere before. All these schedule issues have been solved somewhere before. When I started working in 1990 with the first two schools where every kid had a laptop, let me say that again, 1990, and we're still arguing about whether kids should have access to computers. Um, I, that was in Australia, and Australia at the time had an incredibly macho attitude towards class size, which was kind of like, you know, teachers had lecterns, there were benches that went from the window to the w opposing wall. A teacher never actually got to the second row of kids because they'd have to shimmy over the furniture to, to approach them physically. Um, and then we, we put laptops in the hands of every kid, and there were 10 or 20 or 30 individual projects taking place in the classroom. All of a sudden, class size mattered. Furniture mattered. The schedule mattered. And, and one of the ways the scheduling was resolved was the teachers voluntarily offered to teach a three-hour humanities block where they would take it upon themselves to teach history, geography, English, in Australia, religious studies. Um, Within that within that period, because they recognized that the kids needed um, needed sufficient time to work on on things that matter to them, and class size all of a sudden became a, a real issue because it wasn't just a matter of of the teacher transmitting to uh, uh, you know to a group of disinterested kids um, in unison, but but the teacher needed to be able to move around and support multiple kids, and the kids needed sufficient time to do meaningful work. You know, and I want to go back to um, Bianca's example. I think I just I spent the last ten years as the president of a nonprofit called Generation Yes that asked kids to learn technology in order to help their own school. And there's example after example after example where kids that no one expects step up. And you know what I learned was kids are kids are just dying to be noticed. They're dying to be valuable. They just they can't. They, they, they don't know how, what to do, so they do what we tell them to. But when you ask them to do something where they perform a valuable service in their own community, which is, you know, helping, is the learning community, is their classroom, they really blossom. I mean, um, there's, there's teachers who, like, worry about this stuff. They look at the list of Arduinos, and they look at the website, and it's just so complicated, and who knows about this stuff. There's nobody better than, like, a 15-year-old to figure that out. Good. Let them do it. You be the expert on whether the Duo or the Uno or the 1.4 or the whatever, you know, bootloader is. Somebody else can do that. You know, the teacher doesn't have to know those technical details if you're willing to, to let kids step into that role. And not just haphazardly, but actually teach them that this is their role, that being, you know, a smart person and helping your peers is exactly what you're supposed to be doing in school, not finishing a worksheet not doing what I tell you, but that the kids themselves are coming with, up with the ideas and saying, you know what, if we did this or if we bought that, we could do so much more. And I see this all the time with kids. I mean, the, the kids who talk into their sweaters, who all of a sudden are <laughs> the experts, you know, and, and the, the kids with the, with the social capital who never seem to do anything wrong are suddenly turning to the kids who have no social capital and it equalizes things, you know, it equalizes the, the contributions in the classroom and, and when everyone can make a contribution to the classroom that makes, that empowers kids in, in a different way, not just getting an A or, you know, getting a good grade in, uh, on, your, on your test, it empowers kids in all kinds of ways and ways that kids need, they're all hoping to be noticed, they're all hoping to change the world, you know, they're all dreaming about being a superhero 
And here we have the capability of putting this technology, this, you know, a 3D printer that makes something out of nothing. We have the ability to let them touch that future so that when they go to college and they go, yeah, I've been doing that since middle school. You know, that kind of stance, we have the ability to give them that magical power today. I think we can't, we can't turn our back on that. Sylvia, can I just um, jump in real quick and, and state that um, for me, you, you guys were speaking about a lot of um, theories and you know Dewey and Piaget and all these names earlier. When I go into my classroom, those are the last people I'm thinking of. <laughs> and um, what MAET has equipped me with, and I think the most important thing that they've done with me is one, they have given me some tools. Um, but more importantly is they've given me the courage to be that person who can step out of the way, who can just hand these things to the kids and not worry that I'm not the authority in my classroom or learn along with my kids. And I think um, for teachers, you know, it's scary to go in front of your class and say, I don't know what the hell this does, but, you know, let's just figure it out. Um, and, you know, I think I become more of a guide for the problem solving process for them, but before long they take over that process and MAET as a program has really um, given me the courage to allow the creativity to allow, you know, to step out of the way essentially, to provide what I need to provide and then just see where my role is, see what my role is. I mean, I have no idea what my role is going to be when I do these things. and. Um, and MAT gives me the confidence, or this program has given me the confidence, the courage to go to my administrators and say, I think this is okay that I don't know what my role is. Um, but, but also to navigate that, you know, spontaneously um, and have this great outcome. The kids loved the program. They want part two. Um, I have one girl who spent all six days, you know, however many hours, 18 hours, working on her cardboard automata, which was not done by the end of the course, but she had this beautiful galloping horse that she had made all the gears for this thing, and it, and it was amazing. And when would she ever have the opportunity to just concentrate and focus on that one thing? Um, but but moving that into the, the regular curriculum, moving that into a 15-minute class period, We'll take practice, we'll take time, we'll take me taking risks. And teachers need to know it's okay to take those risks. You know, we had a teacher say last week at, at CMK that one of, the, one of the, the epiphanies or positive experiences she had was that there was a remarkable range of expertise. There were people who had serious knowledge and, and prior experience with materials and others who had none working together without any hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, I said earlier, I, I, I meant it. We the words we use have have meaning, and I never worry about classroom management because I never go in thinking I need to manage a classroom. And there's a kick me sign on my back or something because I work in schools all over the world, and it's not uncommon for a, a client to say, "We were wondering if you could work with all the sixth graders." And I say, oh, when? And they say, now. And I walk in, and there's 120 <laughs> kids with laptops, and I have three hours. And that was literally the warning that I had. Um, but in that case, and in working in a place, a prison, where there was a, an emergency a day, um, no one's ever shushed or made to feel bad or thrown out. Um, mm -hmm. In three years in the prison, we didn't have a single kid who had to leave the class for discipline reasons. And in mm -hmm. fact, despite the fact that the work began in 1999, which is now 15 years ago, um, we, we built the Makerspace, a place where the kids could spend you know, five hours uninterrupted every day working on personally meaningful projects. Um, young people, this is something I say all the time, young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity, and it's incumbent upon us to build upon that capacity for intensity, otherwise it manifests itself as boredom or ennui or just wasted potential misbehavior. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan of programming. I'm I'm sort of zeroing in on sixth grade being like the sweet spot for kids to fall, to become great at programming because they have this remarkable intensity and and can get lost in solving you know challenging problems. You know, my one of my recent anecdotes was working in a school where I hang out in Australia, and we had hit a wall with some programming problem. I was working with a couple little goofy kids that the principal had identified for me because they weren't very popular and they weren't doing very well in school. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, we, 
I I went home feeling really guilty because I wasn't going to see the kids for another five days, and and we hadn't been very successful. And I spent a bunch of time online trying to find materials and some inspiration that would help them con continue in their progress. And I emailed the principal with a YouTube video link, and she called them to the office. That in and of itself tends to be remarkable in schools, even though it shouldn't be. And she let the kids watch the video on her iPad. And, and after they watched the video, they said, can we have a piece of paper and pencil? And they spontaneously started taking notes when they watched it for a fourth and fifth time. Um, there's not a snowball's chance in hell these kids would have ever taken, no in class, taken notes in class. Um, this was something that was sort of organic and came from within them. And it, like Sylvia said, they have a relationship with the material and, and, and a conversation with the materials that speak to them. But I actually think that one one of the I, the things that we're tapping into is is the intimacy of learning, that it, that it comes from within the learner, um, it in and then sort of interacts with the environment, with the materials, with with colleagues. Um, but I, I think if you go into a classroom thinking of the kids a, in a collegial fashion, um, as opposed to some sort of hierarchical or worse or adversarial fashion. Um, I mean, because make no mistake, there's a lot of people who, who think the school system should be about getting kids to do what we want them to do. And we talk about the school-to-prison pipeline, but if you're lining kids up to cross the hall or, or laminating rules that they would never imagine breaking along with the punishments posted um, or, or lots of the other – or having silent lunch or – removing recess from the school day and doing a lot of the things that are unfortunately happening in schools. Um, this isn't a school-to-prison pipeline. School is indistinguishable from prison for too many kids. Um, there's not a, it's a very short pipeline. Um, and, and so, like I said, I think I just wrote a paper that may or may not be accepted somewhere. I'll publish it at some point um, called something like Progressive Education and the Maker Movement um, symbiotic relationship or mutually assured destruction. And I really think that these remarkable tools and materials that are now available to us that allow kids to do real things, this is, this is the real key of, 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 of making or making in 2014, that schools have always been about simulations of things, making models of things, but now you can make real things. At CMK last year, I'm sorry, last week, Teachers made a, made the Bellagio fountains, and at a certain level, it's a scale model. But at another, it's choreographed fountains with lights, and it's been a dream of mine for years to be able to squirt water under computer control, um, just because it wasn't something we could do. Now it's something that they demonstrated they could do, and um, the fact that you can make real things means that their learning experience can be more authentic. And I, I think that if not just us, but if our colleagues fail to embrace this moment, um, I, I think there are a lot of forces of darkness that want to replace teachers with YouTube videos. And, and one of the things that really startled Sylvia and I when we started going to maker fairs um, wasn't that parents tell us their kids are bored in school. You know, I fully expect that. Um, what we didn't expect was the unanimity with which we heard parents say things like, school is killing my child. Um, look what they're capable of doing, and the school doesn't give a damn about it. And that, that's not cool because not only is it bad for kids, um, but these folks tend to be on the more progressive, liberal side of the equation. And they're now, in, they're now sort of in solidarity with with the conservative forces that want to privatize everything and, um, and you know, hand, hand formal education over to Khan Academy and real estate developers. Um, um, so I, I think this I represents think an opportunity, opportunity for us, for us to, 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 to take to renewed interest in tra craft traditions and the aesthetic associated with that, that um, um, as well as, as, well as, as new, materials new materials and tools. When parents when see parents through the eyes and hands of their hands kids what's possible, kids possible. Um, they're, they're um, willing they're to make, willing make pretty dramatic changes, dramatic changes in, in, in their expectations in their for what school can be. 
You know, I, I just want to jump in quickly because I need to uh, that's, that's, head out, unfortunately. I just yeah, wanted to say... Finished, but thank you for that. Thank you for that. Well, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 uh, I completely appreciate um, Gary's and Sam's perspective. And, and, uh, well, let's wrap up, guys. Go and, ahead. And, and, and agree, yeah, and agree, um, agree completely. In fact, I was, uh, I was a former... Um, I mean, I'm, I am a former uh, early childhood teacher. And I've often said that I feel like the uh, the maker movement has nothing on second grade teachers from you know right. twenty years ago. Um, but I, I did want to say one last thing that uh, you know I know is something that is um, part of your thinking, Gary and Sylvia. But but I, I wanted to raise, and this came up last week actually. Michelle brought up this point, and and that's the, that's the whole social nature of this kind of work as well, and the degree to which. Um, uh, I think what facilitates this work and makes it um, even more rich and and uh, and actually is a, a deeply embedded um, I think ethos in the maker movement is this notion of you know it's not just that you're simply constructing on your own although that does happen but that it's but that you're constructing within a community and that it's important to be able to I think as you talked about early on Gary you know the, ha have the opportunity to share your work so you're not just producing work but you're sharing your work and you're receiving support from from mentors um, and peers and I think uh, you know I was, I was really struck um, I was at Maker Faire a couple of years ago and heard Dale Darty speak I mean who's the founder of Make Magazine and, and Maker Faire and and he talked about the fact that, from his perspective, the, the the notion of community is is in fact even more important than the ability to actually make things. Um, this this uh, opportunity to have um, uh, these interactions with peers. Um, so I need to hop off, but you know, I, I just I would I would love to hear if there's going to be more time. You know, uh, your response to to that notion. And uh, and I just want to thank you again also for, for taking the time Thanks. today. Thanks. No. I, 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 I Sylvia, you want to take it? Then I'll take it. Then I my two cents. It's and a lot of people are leaving, and Michelle had to leave too. But yes, last comments. Sylvia, you seem like you're muted still, or right now. Um, sorry go. about that. So, um, last know, I'm comments. not sure exactly what Dale said, but it seems like a community that's that's about nothing doesn't have anything to talk about. Um, I, 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 what would they talk about if they're not actually doing something? It just seems a, a kind of silly. Um, it's nice to have friends, but I, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about something that begins with the making, that starts with this construction of knowledge. And I think my final comment is um, uh, kind of related to that. When we talk about making, making I constantly think about how to elevate the question because. What I don't want people to think is that any making any is making is working. Because, because uh, schools will take, schools that, will take that, and that and devalue it. Devalue it. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden it's macaroni, macaroni cologne Friday afternoon, afternoon, afternoon. And hooray, and we're hooray, we've done, we've done, our, job. done our job. So, so I've always tried to elevate the conversation to computation, computation, concepts. I hear myself echoing. I'm gonna stop. Yeah. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I think we yeah we we should stop anyhow. Just um, I, we have all had things to get back to. Um, thank you so much, Sylvia and Gary, for um all of your comments here today, and um, Chris Sloan um and Chris um from from Michelle. Ireland there and Michelle. Thank you and Paula. Um, and, thanks for the work uh, you guys do. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks everybody. So um, this show usually happens, just to say, at um, 9 p.m. Eastern on um, edtechtalk.com slash TTT um, on Wednesday evenings, uh, and it's been happening for a while now. Um, it's part of the Ed Tech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and um, Jeff Lebo set up several years ago. Thank you all, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs>